All right, good afternoon. My name is Barbara Ruling. Um, I'm a facilitator and the CEO of uh, BookSprints. So we'll start from the simple assumption that a publication um, is really part of a conversation. So those of you here who know the Coco Foundation, they will maybe see that um, I stole their slogan that software is a conversation. But that's just because I really like their slogan, so thank you for being open about it. Um, so publication, of course, is many things, right? So not in the least it's the currency of academic careers. Um, but today I want to look uh, at publications as part of a conversation. Um, and the publications that I know most about are books, but you can also replace this by articles or anything else. Um, so when we look at publications as, as a conversation, that really means looking at it from the perspective of a community. So in a community, um, the publication can really be uh, the scholars, their audiences. So these may be scholars of the same discipline, of other disciplines. These may be maybe students of a textbook, um, civil society organizations, whoever may be the audience of a book. But uh, not every publication really has that community. And some publications really struggle to generate or to activate a community around it. So how about getting the audience involved in the first stages before it's even published, so in the writing process itself? Um, I'll share a few examples today um, of books that have involved the community from the inception um, by inviting them to a collaborative uh, writing sprint where they together write and edit the book. Um, so the result of a book sprint is not a volume of, of text of single authors. It's really uh, a book of shared authorship and a single narrative. Um, so it's a little bit different than what some people have maybe done, like hackathons where you can come up with a wiki or something like that. It's really a single narrative and um, shared authorship. So that means that this process itself is really community building. And um, it's also this same community that is then the one that carries the conversation forward. So um, starting with the what. What are collaborative writing sprints? Um, so in the beginning, that's an idea for a book. Um, and when you take the perspective of the community, that idea really is a need, right? Like, what, what book does this community need? Um, so that cannot be said for every publication. Not every publication comes out of a need uh, of a community. But in these cases, they usually do. So many times, people who come to us, they really have complex topics that are hard to grasp just from one single perspective. And they haven't been well defined yet, maybe, or they have a lot of implicit or practical knowledge that hasn't really been documented anywhere. Uh, so these are the topics that we see a lot. And around these topics, um, there may be a group of experts that um, gather. So maybe between 5 and 15 is what we sort of find a good group number. Um, and they come together for five days in this collaborative process. And together with the help of a facilitator and then also a specialized team of copy editors, illustrators, and book designers, and an online platform that supports that whole process, um, they go through this process. And in the end of the five days, there's a book that's basically ready to be published. So these are just a few examples um, of books that we have done. I have some physical examples also here. So this, for example, is the Pupsuit Manual that was written in three and a half days in June. Um, this is the Research Communication Supporters Guide that was drafted after the FORCE conference last year. I think also in three to four days, John, something like that. And then it went through some review and they just printed and distributed it here, which is really awesome to see. Um, so yeah, these are just a few examples. This all started about 10 years ago when um, Adam Hyde, who's here also, um, really felt that need for rapid and collaborative book production for open source software manuals. So he started experimenting with ways to make writing documentation fast and effective and also fun. And now 10 years later, yeah, you see all of the different topics that we've been working on. We really refined the method and now still do a lot of software handbooks, but also scholarly publications and even one fiction book that was kind of an accident. Um, so just to quickly show you a few examples of what that can look like. Um, five years ago, the European Commission funded um, a series of five book sprints to test the method for scholarly publications. And one of them was, was with a project called um, Urban Interaction Design. So they already they had a big um, EU fund uh, for this project with the same name, Urban Interaction Design. And that worked at different academic institutions across Europe for two years. Um, and then they came together for a book sprint, also I think four days. And uh, they invited not only the researchers, but also um, a policymaker from a Polish city, um, an architect from Spain, and a guerrilla gardener from Brazil. 
And together they really looked at this at this topic. And it was really interesting to see that after two years and like burning through this big grant, they still really struggled to define what their project really was about. Uh, so they had this name, Urban Interaction Design, but the whole book sprint really started with a lot of very heated discussions about what the definition of that term actually was. Um, so last week I um, talked to the organizer, Martin Brinskoff, who's the Associate Professor for Interaction Technologies at our host university. So he's the one peeking through here. And, um, and I asked him what happened to the book. And he wrote me, um, it became a key reference in an essence field still used in teaching and for reference. The strength is in putting weak signals into solid form early instead of waiting two to three years or never. So in other words, that's really interesting because the book wasn't just sort of the result of the research project. It was really sort of the inception of a field for them. So it wasn't the end of a conversation. It was really a conversation itself. So since then, we've done a lot of book sprints um, with academics. One little example I want to show, which I really like, is with the University of Brighton. They did um, an interesting book sprint involving academics and community workers um, to explore sort of how new academic theories might help understand what uh, the everyday work was like in the community sector. Um, so it was really interesting to me because it wasn't just transdisciplinary. They really crossed the boundaries of the academic institution itself. So this is their book, New Practices for New Publics. And then one recent example is the book, um, Open Knowledge Institutions Reinventing Universities. Um, this book's right now on MIT Press PubPub um, online platform and it's open for community review. The book was written by a group of 13 authors in five days. So um, Cameron Allen is on the photo. He's also here as one of the authors. Um, but also including um, other research professors, open knowledge advocates, science communicators, economists, publishers, and they really gathered around um, this one topic. So when they had planned the book sprint, um, they really saw it more as a, as a kickoff meeting for a new project, and they thought that it would be a good way to engage sort of a group of people uh, who would then be interested in working with them further. But during the book sprint, it quickly emerged that what they really needed was a manifesto. And this experience of building an argument for this issue really built a coalition within the group. And it's really nice to see that the same authors um, are now also the same ones who are creating sort of a, a buzz around the book with op-eds and social media and try to generate a discussion around the book. So if you're interested, it's on Pop Up. It's quite a nice little book if you want to take part in that uh, discussion. So the next question is why. Why do collaborative writing sprints? This photo is from a real book sprint. Um, writing a book in five days is quite stressful. <laughs> so the question is, why put yourself through that, right? Um, there's so many reasons I can think of uh, why I think it's a great thing to do, but I try to sort of um, boil it down to three. And one is, um, it's a great way to tackle complexity. So uh, like I said, we often have topics that are really hard to describe just sort of from one perspective or just from one, um, one person, one discipline. Um, and also, they often include sort of practical experiences or implicit knowledge that may not be found anywhere in literature. And this really comes out in the conversation and working closely with others. So for example, um, when we did the, the, the series of book sprints with the European Commission, they wanted to test if the method would work for scholarly publications. But I think what they found is that actually something quite different came out of it. And one of the reasons was that the researchers were so frustrated with the conventions and the jargons of their genre, they didn't actually want to do a sort of a typical scholarly publication. Um, and what was interesting to see that this kind of collaboration across the disciplines and, and working also with people outside of academia, it, it seemed to give them permission to sort of break out of those conventions um, and not do the typical publication. So instead sort of, of driving a single argument, these books really sort of mapped an emerging field, they framed a concept, they created a discussion, and a community around this topic. One other great thing is that um, writing collaboratively really puts the audience first. So you think of it from the community perspective, um, meaning that you really look at like what is that book that that community needs, not what is that that helps me in my career and brings me forward, it's really looking at what, what do you need to what do you need to read? What is that book that you need maybe to teach, uh, to um, to yeah convince others of, of your point of view, etc. Um, and the other thing that really uh, 
happens in this kind of collaborative writing is um, it's an excellent check on jargon and it really creates read readability. So if you bring people together from different disciplines or across, um, yeah, even outside of academia, it really helps sort of getting out of that bubble. And then the third point is um, building consensus and coalitions. So sharing authorship and the ownership of a publication, it really encourages the group sort of to come up with some kind of consensus and, um, and build a coalition around it. So writing the book really is building a community in itself. Um, so that also means that the book at the moment of its publication already has an active community that's tied to it and that acts as a multiplier. Um, one of the authors of the Open Knowledge Institutions book that I just showed you, uh, Lucy Montgomery, she um, gave us a quote about it saying, the fact that everyone has to agree to put their name on the book is powerful and so is the fact that they have to agree to commit to work on this topic for a week. With the sprint we were able to create a community and buy-in around the topic very quickly. So again, it's not, it's not sort of a, an edited volume with different authors, but it's sort of all of the authors' names together on a single narrative, so you really have to sort of work through the issues. So after the what and the why, the question is how to do it. That's maybe the most interesting part. And um, yeah, I can only say there is no easy recipe. So even after I facilitate maybe something like 30 book sprints, I still every single time ask myself, like, how are we going to pull it off? Um, but I can t try to tell you a little bit um, of how we get it done. And I think it's interesting to see that almost in every session here, the topic came up about uh, what's the technology and what's the community, right? And I think this is also true for this. Um, so I'll just quickly tell you something about the technology. I'm more of the people person. Um, so I can tell you a little bit more about the workflow and the collaboration that we do. Uh, and I can talk about that for hours, but I try to keep it short. So in terms of technology, um, at Book Sprints we work with Editoria, which you can see here. So this is um, uh, the Collaborative Knowledge Foundation's open source platform for collaborative writing and, and rapid book building. So the writing environment, you can see it a little bit on the corner. It, it looks a little bit like a table of content of a book. So you see sort of the book coming together. Um, and the platform is using HTML and CSS, so it, it renders really beautifully paginated PDFs and it generates EPUB and all of that in real time. So um, as soon as the writers are done, the book is done, basically. So if you're interested um, in the technology, um, Alison and Adam are here from the Coco Foundation and they can say much more intelligent things about it. Um, so I won't try too hard to take on that part. Um, but yeah, going back to the how, like how, how can you write collaboratively in five days? Um, does the technology really enable you to do that? And I think the answer is no. You can't just use the technology and then it just magically happens. Um, the technology certainly enables us to, to write and publish in ways that we've never been able before. Um, but more than anything, it's really working with the people and finding good ways to work with the people that, that makes that happen. And the thing about people is, and I think all of us know this, is people aren't easy, right? And I'm including myself on that. Unfortunately, we're not easy. And if you bring people together who are interesting, have interesting backgrounds, um, different work styles, you'll find that it's even hard to even find the same language. So here's really where sort of our workflow methodology and uh, most importantly, our facilitators make sure that each of the contributors um, can really um, yeah, be productive, find sort of their, their space and their voice, um, participate with their ideas, with their personality, their work style. Um, and all of this is supported by the technology, but the facilitator and, and the workflow that are really sort of the, the secret sauce of, of these book sprints. Um, so just to quickly show you what these workflows look like. Um, so a facilitator comes together with the group of experts and they lock themselves up in a room for five days. And uh, hopefully it's a room with a nice view and if there's a beach nearby or some rolling hills, that also helps. And then the facilitator guides the group through the stages of the process. So starting with the conceptualization of the book, really narrowing the scope, uh, deciding on the, on the target audience, et cetera. And then structuring those ideas and then writing and writing some more and writing some more and rewriting it. And then more than anything, even like much more time spent on the, than spent on the writing is spent on iterative cycles of editing. And this is really sort of where the collaboration happens. So people edit and re-edit each other's text constantly. 
Um, and all of this is then supported by um, the technology that I showed you and a team of uh, designers and copy editors who all work simultaneously on, on illustrating and, and designing and um, copy editing the book. So after five days, you can really sort of split out, uh, spit out um, a beautifully designed book, which is um, already copy edited and it's basically been peer reviewed by all of those people in the group, right? If you have 10 experts, you basically had 10 peer reviewers. Um, yeah, so to start this process, the most important part probably is getting the right people together. And um, as sort of as an open space conferences, et cetera, uh, the right people are always the ones that are present. Um, so you always already have the right people, but just be aware that the people who are present will be the ones who will shape the book, right? So that's really sort of what brings the book together is what are the people who are coming together. So usually this, um, somebody who starts it all, who's deeply invested in the subject, and then considers sort of who to bring in, what, what uh, different perspectives, what experiences to bring together. And uh, one of the learnings that we've had is definitely that a more diverse group creates a much better work environment than, than a more sort of uniform group. So that's definitely uh, one of the big takeaways. Um, and um, yeah, going back to the, the question of community, taking the community seriously and really sort of taking the audience into account uh, one of the great things that you can do if you write collaboratively, you can bring the audience into that process. So you can think like if you write a textbook for, say, master students, you can bring the master students to the process. If you want to write something transdisciplinary, bring in colleagues from other disciplines. Um, if you want to write something for community workers, write the book together with the community workers. Um, this, on the other hand, can also create a lot of power imbalances. So you can imagine, you know, if you have uh, the professor and then a student coming together, um, you really have to sort of balance out um, those power imbalances to make good use of, of these uh, people that you bring in from the audience. And so if we, if we do have uh, someone like that, like a student, for example, or an intern at a book sprint, we really make it clear to all the senior researchers that this is actually the most important person in the room, right? This is the person you're writing for, so they are already, they are already right. Uh, and, these, and these contributors, like the student or the intern, they can be so important to asking all the right questions, showing the limitations in the text, um, really forcing the, the experts to get out of the jargon, clarify, et cetera. And, um, and even better, they can even write the book themselves, right? So they can even write it in a way that's meaningful and, and useful to them. So once you have the right people together, um, you want to create the right environment for them. And this includes the technology, so you know, a technological environment that makes it easy and, and, and fun to collaborate in. Um, but it, more than anything, it, it also means creating the right space for the people. And what we've seen over and over again is uh, real space collaboration works um, in this kind of intensity, in this kind of depth. Uh, remote participation does not work in these kind of contexts. Um, and the right environment, again, like if you have a beach or some rolling hills, that really helps. Uh, good food, a nice view, uh, daylight. There's so many conference rooms who don't have any windows, so if you're locked in there for five days, um, that's tough. And uh, yeah, once you have the right people in the right space, um, then what we do is we facilitate collaboration, right? So we too often assume, I think, that just gathering is enough. Uh, but uh, yeah, if you organize a conference, for example, you know how much work goes into that. It's not just sort of having the opening up the space and then things just happen. Um, and we, I think we've all been to a lot of unproductive meetings and, and workshops, um, and nothing really comes out of it. Also, the work styles and the personalities are really different, and bringing people together with really different backgrounds means, like I said before, they really first have to come up sort of with a common language. How do they even name things? How do they even talk about things? Uh, and then in a book sprint, like, again, it's shared authorship. So it's not a workshop where you can just like quietly sit back and disagree, because you will share the authorship with others, right? So you really want to make sure you get your points across. Um, so it has to be more active, and it has to be like sort of a, a very intense form of, of collaboration. So that means you have to build a lot of trust within the group, right? Everybody has to really uh, share a common goal and shape this goal together and, and really trust each other. Um, so the way that we solve this is by um, you know, bringing in facilitators who are external in a way to the community and, and to the topic that the book is about. So they don't have any stake in the community, they don't have any claims through the arguments that are made in the book. They can really exclusively focus on helping the contributors to achieve what they sort of shape together as, as their goal. Um, and they're also the ones, the facilitators who, you know, can uh, accommodate everybody's work style. 
uh, just make sure that the discussions stay focused, uh, they can stop the ramblers and support the introverts and balance on these power imbalances that I was talking about earlier. Um, and the nice thing is that if you really manage uh, to make everybody feel that they have an equal say in the design and the outcome of this book, and really get everybody to work in this kind of intense form of collaboration together, um, what we see is not only um, a really great sense of accomplishment, because there's a tangible outcome at the end of five days, uh, we also see extreme levels of motivation. People work really, really hard in these sprints because they really sort of can shape the goal in the beginning themselves and then see they're really pulling the same strings together and work towards this goal together. Um, so yeah, high motivation. And the, other, and the other outcome is that this is already then the best basis to get these people committed over time to that publication and its dissemination. So this publication going forward already has built its own community. So yeah, I can talk for hours about this, but um, I'm also really interested in, in hearing what you have to say about it, your comments and your questions, so I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Um, when I hear collaborative working and like uh, working on something uh, together, the first thing that comes to my mind is who, like, how do we attribute responsibility in the end, and who would be accountable for what in case something goes wrong? And I was wondering whether you've thought about this in any of these book sprints, or whether anything similar has happened in the past. Hmm. Yeah, it's a really interesting question. It's actually a question that comes up a lot with uh, academics. Um, so usually everybody gets to read the entire book before the book sprint is over, right? So um, you have enough time to, first of all, like I said, like build that common goal in the beginning and build enough trust around it. And then um, every, every single piece of text goes through at least like three, four editing cycles. Um, so by the end it goes out of the door, people pretty much know what's in the book. Um, but uh, yeah, it's definitely it's definitely a little bit of of a risk, I think, and and people are anxious about it, and especially academics are a little bit anxious about it. Um, so the goal definitely is to find that um, that trust in the book and feel good about sort of putting the name on the title and sharing that that responsibility. I actually have a question about. Um, I know I've been, I've participated in one of these, and something that's um, come up is the egos of that are unique to academics, you know, like in the sense that, like, although you, everybody has to come to the table and work on this together, there is this, um, like, making things perfect and not not that there isn't sharing, but it's just that like perfectionism and like the iterative process is something that is like everybody has their own personal style and everybody tries to like you know make everybody else have take on their style and um, so I'm just wondering like what are some observations you've had about working in like this kind of fields these kind of spaces when you're doing book sprints about this kind of subject area? Yeah, it's, it's a really interesting question. Um, I think egos are always attached to sort of experts like if people have worked in a field for a long time They don't have to be academics to have sort of a, a big stake in it um, I think what's a little bit trickier with academics is that a publication, like I said before, it's a, it's a currency in their career also, right? It's, it's, it's a little bit different than if you work in an NGO or something like that. Like, you're not being measured by your publications. So I think this is, um, this is something that we find is uh, always cre creating a little bit more uh, stress on, on uh, scholars. Um, yeah, the, I mean, there's no real recipe to it. I think um, we can just sort of try to facilitate this as, as good as possible. and. And um, usually that's this moment in, in a book sprint. Um, so we, we like to do five days. Sometimes we do a little bit less and then you feel the stress more. If you have uh, five days, that's usually this moment where you see that people start to let go. Um, so that's in the, in the beginning, everybody writes a little bit in different styles and then they start editing each other's and then there's, so there's a little bit of friction. But then usually there's this one moment when everybody starts to see sort of, okay, this is what we're doing. This is the common style. This is sort of what we're working towards. And um, and it's not going to be my personal book. It's going to be really a collaborative effort. And people start letting go. And then it, it's kind of magical to, to see that happening. 
I have maybe a, a similar question to what's already been posed about the dynamics between the people who are working on this book. I work in uh, medical education and I'm with a patient organization. And we're really interested in having our patients as part of the co-building of our resources. But we're a worldwide organization. And in some countries, the dynamic between the hematologist and the patient is almost non-negotiable. How do you, have you had any experience working with, for example, patients and healthcare providers? And, and how do you navigate that dynamic to empower the patient participation and to bring the, the, the person who's really used to having a certain level of authority value that involvement? Hmm. Yeah, that's, that's really fascinating. I don't have any experience in that field. Um, the only thing I can probably compare it to is, like I said, like, uh, you know, you have uh, the established professor in a field, and then you have the intern of an organization. Um, so what we what we do is like the thing is about having an external facilitator that you can sort of triangulate that right. You you don't just have the one on one uh, relationship. You have sort of somebody who doesn't really care about the title of either or the other right. They're both experts. The patient is an expert from their point of view and. And um, the the healthcare provider is, a, is an expert from their point of view, and having sort of a, a third person who doesn't really step like doesn't doesn't take part in these dynamics um, that really helps, and um, and what we try to do is sort of the the least powerless uh, person in, in that dynamics trust them the most because they are often the ones who are actually the, on the receiving end right the the audience that I'm talking about, and um, that's hard for the experts to understand that. You know, they they may know a lot, but they may not know how to best get it across, or they may really have to also open up to seeing the other side. Um, but uh, when they get it, it's 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 quite fascinating to to turn that dynamic around. Uh, can I ask a quick quick one? Is it's related? Who gets to decide who are the right people? Yeah, that's usually an organizer who comes to us, and uh, and we can just sort of help them, uh, you know, with uh, some of the learnings that I said. Try to find a diverse group. Try to find somebody from the audience. Um, but yeah, that's always somebody who's usually very invested in the topic who brings together the people. So, if you had a lot of climate change deniers, sorry, one, say you had some climate change deniers, and you had an expert in that area, he brought his own group or she brought his own group. How? Would that just go ahead? Would you let them? How would you navigate that sort yeah, of? It's, it's a very good question. <laughs> yeah, I'm a cultural anthropologist by training, and my neutrality as a facilitator has been tested a couple of times. Uh, but we, <laughs> but we, we haven't had these extreme cases yet. We had one case of um, uh, a group of masculinists who wanted to write a masculinist manifesto, spelled with a PH, because they don't use the letter F. Um, <laughs> We had a lot of debates whether we, we would want to facilitate something like that. Uh, in the end, uh, I think they pulled out. I, I think we weren't uh, encouraging enough. So we haven't had like an extreme case like that yet, but it would be really interesting. It's a good question. 